Well, hello everyone, um, and welcome to our breakout se session. My name is State Representative Brian Sims from Pennsylvania, and today's breakout session focuses on the growing power that the LGBTQ community has in state legislatures. There's no question about it that in state legislatures that are either Democratic or progressive leaning, we are seeing LGBTQ bills flourish. But similarly, in those state legislatures like my own, where we're hostile to LGBTQ rights, what we've seen is uh, a continual opposition to equality. We've got a really exciting panel today made up of senators and state representatives um, that are going to be introducing. But before that, we have a video from our sponsors at Union Pacific. Hi, everybody. My name is David Black, and I work at Union Pacific Railroad in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm proud to serve as the incoming president of our LGBT plus employee resource group, which we call Bridges. Union Pacific has proudly supported the work of the Victory Fund and Institute for many years. Our railroad runs across 23 states, and our leadership believes our company should resemble the communities we serve. Our own internal diversity and inclusion initiatives aim to foster an environment where everyone can bring their whole self to work. Our company also believes that we should be active externally by supporting local equality efforts, legislative initiatives, and organizations like Victory. My fellow employees who identify as members of the LGBT plus community and our many allies across the railroad are excited to join you today for this discussion about equality achievements and challenges in our state legislatures. Thank you for participating in the International LGBT Leaders Conference 2020, for your support of the Victory Fund and Institute, and for supporting each other. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. Enjoy this session and the balance of this outstanding conference. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, and thank you, Union Pacific. So the title of our plenary is Power in State Legislatures, and I am excited to be joined by four powerful individuals, uh, three that are already in state legislatures and one that was just recently elected. I'm going to introduce them all and then give them an opportunity to say a couple of words and introduce themselves. We are joined today by uh, Senator-elect Jabari Brisport from New York. We're joined by Senator Kay Floyd from Oklahoma. Senator Dallas Harris from Nevada, and my good friend and colleague, State Representative Sam Park from Georgia. Sam, we're going to start with you. Why don't you, why don't you say hello? Sure. So, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here with um, this great panel of, of LGBTQ leaders. Uh, my name is Sam Park, first openly gay man elected to the Georgia State Legislature. Um, and, and on the theme of growing our power, I'm happy to report uh, that, that we've added or elected two new LGBTQ leaders who have broken barriers. Uh, Senator-elect Kim Jackson, who will be the first openly LGBTQ uh, senator in, in, in the Georgia State Legislature, and Marvin Lim, uh, Representative Marvin Lim, will be the first um, Filipino ever elected uh, to the Georgia General Assembly. And so Georgia is continuing uh, to slowly but surely uh, move, uh, make progress and move in the right direction. Um, again, happy to be here with everyone and I look forward to a fantastic conversation. Uh, thank you, Representative. What I am going to do is I'm going to cut to Senator Harris from Nevada. Nevada, I did it. You did do it. Well Darn done. It. I, I, I'm so sorry. It's okay. I know for some reason it's so tough, but you're doing well. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Listen, it's always a pleasure uh, to be with the Victory Institute. Uh, to be a small piece of the work that, that the Victory Institute does is, is uh, an honor. Um, I'm happy to be with you all to discuss state legislatures. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people underestimate the impact that that local government has on their lives. And so uh, this is a really important discussion on how we can move our, our country forward uh, one state legislature at a time. Looking forward to being with you all. Uh, thank you, Senator Harris in Nevada. <laughs> we are also joined by Senator-elect Jabari Brisport in New York. Senator-elect, hello, sir. 
Hey, Representative Sims, and hello, Victory Fund. Great to see you all. Welcome to downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> Hope you're all enjoying the view. Um, I am uh, Jabari Brisports, uh, the uh, first uh, openly gay person of color ever elected to the uh, New York State Legislature. Uh, could not have done it without the Victory Fund's help. Uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. And thanks for all of you being on here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, just to reiterate things you've heard already, you know, there's a lot of power in the states. They are incredible laboratories for um, pro LGBTQ plus uh, legislation and progressive legislation. And I'm proud to be part of an incoming uh, freshman class in New York of the uh, most progressive uh, legislature in our state's history. So uh, let's do this. Senator elect, it's, it's exciting to have you with us. And our last panelist, certainly not the least, our Senator is uh, Senator Kay Floyd from Oklahoma. Thank you, Ryan. Brian, and uh, thank Victory Fund and Victory Institute for hosting this. It's so important that we have these discussions and that we have this conversation. Uh, I, fun fact, I uh, was actually the very first experience I had with uh, Victory Fund was I took their training about four weeks after I decided to run for office, and that was eight years ago. And it was a training down in Dallas, and it was remarkable. It was the closest thing I've ever seen to uh, what campaigning and being an elected official was really like and it helped me so much in my first campaign so uh, a belated thank you to victory fund for that uh, i am currently the senate democratic leader uh, minority leader uh, we have a super majority of republicans but uh, i'm just looking forward to our dialogue today thank you senator senators and representative each of you has been a, a trailblazer in your own state many of you touched upon it just in your remarks just now um, what does it mean for each of you to be out as a legislator? And I'm going to start with Senator Harris. So um, one thing I like to say a lot is representation matters, right? And I think what's been so um, fulfilling for me is being able to be that representation. Anytime a young child who possibly looks like me or uh, 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 someone who's struggling with their, their identity or their sexuality, if they can see someone in positions of power, it makes them understand uh, and get comfortable with the idea that they too belong that they too can be in those positions. And so uh, for me, uh, it's really an opportunity just to be there and to show my face uh, and, in hopes that that in itself um, can lead to great change in the next, the next group of leaders. Uh, I, I'm sure that the people who are coming up uh, behind us are gonna do so much more than we can ever do. And so um, I like to look back down that ladder every time you come up and, and, and be able to pull some people up. That's, that's what's great for me, representation. Um, I'll just say this as well. I'm fortunate enough to not be a first. Uh, I am actually the second openly gay African-American female in the state Senate in Nevada. Uh, and that is a tremendous thing to be able to say, right? What a privilege for me, I feel, to not be a first. Um, so let me just give a shout out to Senator P uh, Pat Spearman. Uh, we serve together currently. She's the first uh, African-American openly gay female in the state Senate. Um, and so uh, that for me um, paved the way uh, for people like myself and, and I'm hoping I can pave the way for others. What a wonderful way of reflecting on why, or one of the many reasons, that it does matter so much to have out people in office. Uh, Representative Park, you had an opportunity to, to both interact with and mentor a number of out people in politics. What has it meant for you to be out in the Georgia House of Representatives? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think uh, there's two components, um, at least from my perspective. One is to break barriers and to demonstrate to not just your colleagues, but your, the communities that you represent and that you're a part of, uh, that you can, that there's nothing that you can't do. And that when all is said and done, you can serve your community, you can serve the state that you love, that you care about uh, with integrity. You can be honest um, about who you are, uh, not just with uh, your, your colleagues, but again, with, with your entire state. And especially when, uh, you know, for, for those who have uh, intersectional backgrounds, it also breaks barriers within a community. Um, so for example, within the Korean American community, within other Asian American communities that tend to be socially conservative, uh, being an out and openly gay uh, Asian American legislator sends a signal to them uh, that in this country, 
uh, what matters more than your race, your ethnicity, your sexual orientation is the content of your character and how well you are able to lead. And so I think being out, being honest, and being able to break barriers is a key element. But of course, the other component to that, as uh, Senator Harris had mentioned, is paving the way for others. Um, I'm, I'm so incredibly honored um, and proud um, that you know after I was elected, we saw Matthew Wilson elected in 2018. And two years later, again, we saw Marvin Lim, uh, the second Asian American um, Democrat elected to the Georgia State Legislature. And again, that, that's just incredibly exciting. And, and happy to be a part of that change um, from, from the perspective of Georgia, but also, of course, from our historic perspective as LGBTQ elected officials. Um, I think it's always important to recognize that we are where we are because we stand on the shoulders of those uh, who paved the way for us, who, who took a lot of uh, the hits, um, especially when uh, LGBTQ legislators were not as accepted. And I think in, in, in that fashion, um, and, and to honor their service and their sacrifice, we need to do everything that within our own power to help pave the way for the next generation. Well, S Senator Floyd, to, to Representative Park's point, especially about intersectionality, which is, is critically important that we recognize, you have served both as an out senator, but also as a woman in the Oklahoma State Senate. What has, been, what has it been like for you serving, or what does it mean for you to serve as an out legislator? When I first uh, first ran, it was for the House of Representatives, and the current representative we had in the seat at the time was the first openly gay man to ever run and be elected in Oklahoma, Al McCaffrey. So when Al went to the Senate and the House seat opened up and I decided to run, Al was tremendously supportive of that. But because it's such a progressive district when I was campaigning, it was as though it wasn't even an issue. So I thought, well, maybe, maybe I just have an unusual district. Maybe people in Oklahoma are becoming more progressive. Um, but the first two years when I was in the House, um, you could tell that there were people, uh, there were people that were uncomfortable, some of them uncomfortable because I was the first woman, the first lesbian ever uh, elected, but some of them were uncomfortable simply because I was just a woman. So it, sometimes, Representative, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's making them uncomfortable. But I, I will tell you one thing that I did notice once I was elected. It was, I started getting groups that would come up and, and ask me to speak to them. And uh, it would be a lot of times young people who were uh, forming uh, LGBTQ uh, support groups in their schools, their high schools and some of their colleges. And they would come up and, and it, was, it was as though they just wanted to see somebody in a position that was like them. They wanted to see somebody who was governing, who they could relate to and go, well, she's like me. She, you know, she's gay like me. And I think that's when I started to realize how critical it was that I was there. Just, just to, to listen to their questions and just to see them so relieved that, that they weren't alone and that there were adults and there were people in, in authority that were like them. So it's been, it's been an incredible, it's been an incredible experience for me. And I, I don't know if I've given those young people that have come up to the Capitol or the groups that I've visited, if I've given them anything, but I, they have definitely given me a lot. Well, uh, Senator-elect Brisport, I imagine that actually sounds very familiar to you, even though you, have, you haven't yet been sworn in. Well, one of the things that's so exciting about you as a candidate is your sort of vibrant um, heritage and how, how present it is and, and who you are and how you lead and the things that you fight for and care about. So I, I'm not going to ask you what it's like for you to be an out legislator. What do you think being out as a legislator will bring to the job that you're about to get to do? Thanks, Rep. Sims. I'm going to repeat something that uh, Senator Harris said, which is that the representation, you know, really matters. And it's a lot like, you know, Harvey Milk said, it's, you know, when you come out, you also make it easier for others to come out of the closet as well. And I want to share a story with everyone of actually my first interaction with the New York State Legislature about 11 years ago was actually fighting for LGBTQ rights. You know, I was... Um, heavily lobbying them as a, just as my fresh out of college to uh, pass uh, same-sex marriage and uh, calling my legislator, reaching out to my friends, getting them to call their state legislators. Um, and, you know, the law did not pass. And um, I remember thinking, being young and thinking, you know, wow, y'all really suck. You know, how, you know, why would you, why would you treat, um, you know, queer people like this, like second class citizens to vote no on same-sex marriage. Um, and I really felt like I was not seen 
or represented as a person by my legislators. Um, it passed years later, and fast forward to um, you know now 2020, where um, I'm entering this legislature as the first uh, openly gay person of color. Um, I want to talk about a time where I helped somebody else feel seen because I'm also a public school teacher, and um, you know I'm teaching for a few more months before I take office in January. Um, I guess a few more weeks at this point. But one of my former students, my uh, I teach uh, middle school. One of my sixth graders, they're uh, they're in eighth grade now. They came up to me. Um, a few weeks ago and, and let me know that, you know, they saw that I, uh, um, they read about me and, and, and read about, you know, some of our policies for uh, LGBTQ rights. And it really, really spoke to them uh, because they had they recently realized they were not they were non-binary. And um, they were so <laughs> they were so uh, grateful to know that somebody was advocating for them. And um, I think that's really important, especially uh, in black culture in central Brooklyn. Um, in communities like mine that, that people feel seen because um, it's, it's often true that they have not been and I, I get to do that for people, which is exciting. That is exciting. And I, I think that, you know, I, one of the, the advantages that we all have of being seen is also letting people know that our priorities span all of the issues that impact everyone else. The gay agenda is is the, the world's agenda, it's everybody's agenda, it's education, it's the environment, it's safety, it's criminal justice reform, it's all of those issues. And, you know, the, the topic of the panel, of course, is the growing influence that LGBTQ people are having in state legislators. Jabari, what are going to be some of your priorities that you're going to go right into in the beginning of 2021? So in New York, when you hear like, okay, like the queer agenda, uh, the media things that people start talking about are things like uh, decriminalizing uh, sex work because of the way that trans women often get targeted by police uh, for it, and um, also repealing something in New York known as the Walking While Trans Ban. Uh, that's the colloquial work name for it, but it's like a it's an anti loitering bill um, that police use to predominantly target just trans women, trans women of color. Um, late at night. So there's those, but then also going back to something you said, Rev Sims, about it being expansive. Um, you know, we won because we focused on very uh, bold universal policies, uh, saying we want to have housing uh, for all, ensuring everyone could have a roof over their head, uh, fighting for health care for all, and uh, fighting for a single-payer system in New York, uh, fully funding education, these are all things that translate to uh, queer people, whether, you know, queer people also need homes and doctors and, um, you know, and the funding for their, their kids, or if they are, you know, our kid need, um, need that, you know, go to school in a, in a building that is well-funded. So um, it's important to me that we like, you know, like you said, Tim, that we tie it all together because truly, um, you know, whenever we're fighting for everyone, we're fi also fighting for queer people. Well, thank you, Senator-elect. As you're running through that list, I'm watching all of the other panelists nod their, their heads Representative Park, what's your agenda like for 2021? We got a comprehensive legislative agenda. I like the word comprehensive, but, you know, of course, being a member of the minority, uh, you know, whether or not, um, you know, it moves forward, um, you know, that, that's, you know, we have to wait and see. Um, of course, uh, operating in a minority or as a member of the minority, oftentimes in order for me to make progress on the bills that I care about, I have to find a Republican sponsor. Um, all of that to say, I think, you know, especially in Georgia that has uh, one of the highest uninsured rates in the country, um, trying to ensure access to health care uh, is, is going to be, of course, uh, will remain one of my first and foremost priorities. Um, Medicaid expand, Georgia is one of those states that has not expanded Medicaid, and we've suffered the consequences. Um, not only have we had rural hospitals continue to shut down, uh, we have an HIV AIDS epidemic. Uh, that's comparable to third world countries, despite the fact that we are the home of the CDC. Um, along those lines, um, I'll be continuing my work on HIV decriminalization in the state. I co-sponsored legislation with a Republican chairwoman. Uh, we were able to pass it out of the House with uh, an overwhelming uh, majority of about 120 to 40, uh, but we did run out of time um, to get it through the Senate. Hopefully there, that kind of bipartisan support for this important issue will remain. Um, I have three bills already pre-drafted. Our legislative session begins uh, in January of next year, but all three of them are focused on providing tax credits and subsidies to working families. Uh, first and foremost would be a state earned income tax credit. Uh, it's a piece of legislation I've introduced every single year uh, I've been down there. And again, even 
though I'm a member of the minority, I think it's important to understand that as a legislator, we do and can influence a legislative process. Um, so along those lines, you know, Republicans have also introduced another state earned income tax credit as well, and hopefully we'll see uh, some progress on that. Um, I've introduced a family, an expansion of a um, child independent care tax credit, um, as well as a expansion of or a reformation of the family caregiver tax credit, which is important, I think, uh, especially when we're looking at the health of older LGBTQ individuals and those uh, living with HIV and AIDS. Um, the last big issue uh, that, that I'll likely be working on, especially given the immediate need, uh, is a comprehensive reform uh, to Georgia's eviction code. We have some of the worst laws on the books. Um, and of course, once the CDC's eviction moratorium expires at the end of this year, um, it's all up in the air. And, and you know, even though the vaccines and, and there is, you know, light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to the pandemic, uh, there's still a lot of economic consequences um, and, and the socioeconomic challenges that have been exacerbated that I think we have to address. Um, and, and at the very least, try and make some progress on uh, uh, from from the state um, from the state legislature. Sam, you're a workhorse, and it's inspiring to watch. Um, Senator Floyd, what are your legislative priorities for 2021? So our caucus priorities are going to be uh, much like a lot of states, and that's going to be COVID related. Uh, we've had the surge that we've got going on in our state right now was uh, is it's been difficult to prepare for because we have a new governor who came in as a business businessman. He's never served in government and his, uh, his attitude and his politics have, have been made uh, survival during COVID very difficult for us. So we're going to be focused completely, well, not completely, but we're going to be focused primarily on COVID uh, dealing with uh, as we start to see the recovery, uh, morbidity problems that we're going to have, the long-term effects of COVID. Uh, we passed by state question last year, this cycle, uh, the Medicaid expansion for Oklahoma. Up to that point, we did not have it. Thank you, Sam. Good luck with you. And so we are going to be working hard to make sure that we've got the money going to the places it needs to go. We're going to have to work harder with our schools as we start getting kids back in the classes uh, around the COVID environment. That's been very difficult in Oklahoma because the rural communities are more likely to um, not take the virus quite as seriously as the urban communities take it. So we've had schools that would reopen for in-person learning and then they'd have to close. And this would go back and forth. Right now, the majority of the state is on virtual learning. We're gonna to have to get the kids back in the classroom, but we're not gonna do that if we can't do it safely. So we've got challenges there. So those are gonna be the high priorities. Uh, personally, the bills that I run, I do a lot of work with domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, one bill that I'm going to run this year is a bill that I started in the House when I was the House, and it was to get suicide prevention training in our schools, especially our junior highs and high schools. Um, and I was able to get it through the House, but not make it mandatory. So since I've been over in the Senate, I've been keeping an eye open for a chance to run the bill again and change one word in it, the, what is currently law, because it did pass and go into law. So I'm going to run a bill this year that changes one word from, from may to shall, to make that suicide prevention training available for our teachers and counselors so that they can help these students who are dealing with not just the, the stress of growing up in, in today's society, but now the stress of COVID. Senator, thank you. You know, Senator Harris, I, I know while Senator Floyd was talking about the challenges faced by Oklahoma, that you were sort of nodding your head in agreement that I, I know that those are some of the same challenges faced by Nevada. What are your legislative priorities going into this next year? Sure. So um, I'm not on the finance committee uh, next session, which I'm feeling very fortunate um, for that fact. I think we're going to have um, somewhere between 1.2 billion and 500 million uh, budget hole that um, leadership and um, the finance committees on both sides are going to have to deal with. Uh, that's going to take high priority, but that's not going to be my day-to-day, -day, fortunately. Um, a couple of big things that I'm working on is HIV decriminalization here in Nevada. Um, we are also going through our books and anywhere where HIV is treated more harshly uh, than any other communicable disease, we are looking to, to, to fix that. 
Um, another big thing I'm working on is criminal justice reform. And that's kind of like a, uh, a 10 point package um, full of, of all kinds of different things, including um, a study to move uh, some calls to 311 so that you can get a, a non-armed response for uh, an emergency where maybe a police, an armed response uh, police officer is not required. Uh, we're looking at an early warning system so that we can catch officers who uh, might for some reason uh, explain bias, but in these kind of untraditional ways, right? Um, we're looking at increasing penalties for not wearing your body, uh, your body worn cameras. Um, so all kinds of cool things in the criminal justice reform space. I'm also looking at things like tiny homes. Um, right now, our zoning does not allow for tiny homes. There's just really literally no place to put them. And so uh, I have a bill that I'm putting forward that would require localities to actually come up with some kind of zoning regulations. Um, I also think that uh, some of the best legislation is stolen. And so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pick up from California, the Crown Act that they passed banning hair discrimination. Uh, we're going to make sure we get that done here in Nevada. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of cool things on the horizon. A lot of cool things on the horizon. You know, to hear each of you talk about your priorities, it's very clear that the things that we work on um, are, are you know can can vary wildly from economic issues, issues about transportation, the environment, certainly equality across the board. And so my my next question for each of you, and Senator Floyd, I'm going to start with you. I think I kind of know the answer to this for a number of, of um, other out legislators, but I, I'm going to ask each of you to kind of dig back into your past and tell me what it was that drove you to first run for office. There are more people right now, more LGBTQ plus kids are around the country right now looking at out LGBTQ plus leaders that might be inspired to do this one day. Senator Floyd, what inspired you to first run for office? So I was an administrative law judge for the state of Oklahoma before I ran for office. I'd been on the bench for 22 years and I had some friends who were legislators and they would call every once in a while and say, will you come and, and talk to one of my colleagues or will you come and talk to a committee about the, this legislation or that legislation? So it wasn't something that I had to do every week, but it was something I enjoyed doing. And toward the last five years or so before I ran for office, it seemed like the times I'd go up to talk to legislators, uh, we had less and less attorneys in the legislature. And so the people I, that I was visiting with uh, were less and less enthusiastic about the law and following it. Is that, is that politically correct? So the last, the last year before I decided to run, I had three experiences where I went up to the Capitol and sat down with different legislators and they asked me to look at their bills and I did and then I gave them an opinion. And these were non-attorneys. And the last conversation I had with one of the legislators, when I told, he said, is my bill unconstitutional? And I said, I believe it is. And he said, I don't care. So he went ahead and he ran the bill because he could, because by that point they had a super majority and it passed. And of course it was later found to be unconstitutional. But I thought about it. And the next time I was invited up to the Capitol, I declined. I said, I'm not gonna go up and talk to people who don't wanna hear what I have to say. And as I, as I hung the phone up visiting with my friend who I just told I was not going to come to the Capitol, I realized, you know, I could do a better job than this. And so it really had absolutely nothing to do with being a lesbian or any specific issue that came up. It was simply that I felt the representation that we had up there just didn't care about the law. It wasn't until I was elected that I realized how much of, of what I was going to end up doing was about making sure people's rights were secured, including LGBTQ community. So I got there one way, but I'm, I'm serving in another, so. Thank you for that. Senator Harris, what drove you to run for office in Nevada? Well, I think I got tired of complaining, right? After a, a after a certain amount of time and you can say, oh, there's not enough women and there's not enough openly gay people and they're all really, really old, you know, like why don't any of them understand the law? You know, and then I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, well, I'm a young black gay woman who's a lawyer. Uh, maybe I have something to contribute here. Uh, and after a certain point, you have to say, why not me, right? And take that plunge and step forward. Um, I was fortunate enough to actually be appointed 
uh, to the state legislature for uh, my first uh, kind of two years. I was actually just re-elected, uh, well elected I guess for my first time here uh, uh, this year. And so thank you so much. So I'm looking forward to, to being able to, to actually um, go to Carson City on the behest of my constituents. Um, it's an honor, right? Uh, and so you, you just gotta, you gotta take the plunge and, and uh, stand up. Jabari, you are in the middle of, of, of doing this for the very first time. You just have you know, broken a whole bunch of ground. Tell us, what was it that drove you to, to make the kind of change that you're about to go make? Thanks. You know, so I live in Brooklyn, and the story of Brooklyn is the same story of the rest of New York City, is the same as every urban center across America, which is that um, a lot of our communities are undergoing rapid gentrification um, and an exacerbation of social inequities where the rich are seemingly to get richer and richer while working class people struggle to get by. Uh, New York likes to pride itself on being this uh, blue progressive state and we're actually number one in the country in terms of income inequality. You know, we are in the midst of um, massive potential budget cuts to things like hospitals, to schools, to transportation. Um, while the wealthiest people in the state have gotten billions of dollars richer, it, it just this their year alone during the pandemic. And um, in terms of why I got into this to begin with is because you see that and you feel that. You see it when uh, big glass towers are rising up in the neighborhood while others are being evicted for, um, because their rents are ri rising out of control. Um, you see it when uh, you go, you, I, you know, I go to teach in a school and my students cannot get their textbooks, right? Or if my students are homeless because we have failed as a society to ensure that every child in the city and, and this country uh, has a home and, and a bed that they can call their own. And when you compare that with just the extreme inequity and the runaway inequality, it really makes your blood boil. And it makes you want to say, I wanna fight and do something uh, for my community. I wanna fight against this. And I know, I know we could structure things in the society much, much more fairly than they're being structured right now. Well, Sam, I know you agree completely with Jabari. What were you doing before you ran for office and what sparked you to, to decide to do it? Well, there's a lot of lawyers on this panel. Um, I'm, I'm also an attorney, um, but it's not why I ran for office. Um, uh, back in 2014, um, you know, I was in the, the well, I, I was, you know, watching and paying attention to all the issues um, after Stacey Abrams gave me an opportunity uh, to work as her intern uh, back in 2012 when she was minority leader of the Georgia House Democratic Caucus. Um, but in 2014, Georgia Republicans, they blocked Medicaid expansion, leaving more than half a million Georgians um, without access to health care. At the end of that year, uh, my mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and it was uh, public health insurance, Medicaid and Medicare, uh, that gave her a fighting chance. And so that big policy issue suddenly became uh, very personal. And that ultimately became the fire uh, in my belly uh, to challenge a three-term Republican incumbent uh, who was very well liked, very well respected, um, and against all odds um, through building a grassroots, multiracial, uh, multi-generational coalition, uh, we won. Uh, we won by just a few hundred votes. Uh, I won the same night that Trump was elected, which was a surreal experience. Half my team was crying, half my team was celebrating. Um, but, but, you know, one of the things that I think is so important for, for legislators um, and, and for those who are interested in running for office is, you know, to, to really know their why. And, and for me, you know, I think it's a blessing and a curse to a certain degree that that why was so clear for me and and that reason uh the reason for which for why i first ran for office um is still very much the reason why uh you know i continue to fight uh, as difficult as it may be um again to ensure especially in the midst of this pandemic um to ensure that every american every georgian uh, has access to health care especially in the wealthiest uh, nation in the world Thank you, Sam. You know, one of my, my favorite parts of being a, a queer elected official and working with other queer elected officials is, is asking this question. 
Um, the, the reasons that so many of us seek public office are about the service and about the things that we can do to, to fight marginalization, to fight, to, to battle the ills that, that many of us have faced. And I, I, hearing all of your answers is just incredibly inspiring. And so I want to thank you for, for, um, giving us very substantive answers to what I, I hope were questions that you enjoyed. I, I have a really quick, funny, easy question for all of you before I give you a chance to kind of wrap up. And, and I'm going to tweak this question just a little bit. I want to know from each of you, what is the one thing about working at your job, working in your legislature, in your state, that you wish other people knew about? And Sam, I've already got you, so I'm going to start with you. Hmm. Well, I mean, in Georgia, it's a part-time legislature, so we get paid subpar federal poverty wages. <laughs> so it really is about service, and I think, especially if you're in the minority, um, you know, it, it, you know, you really have to know why you're fighting and and, and what it is that gets you out of bed. Um, all of that to say, again, you know, Georgia, you know, we turn blue this cycle. We are making progress, and and I hope folks who may be watching. Um, you know, lean in um, with, the, with the realization that your vote is your power and we have an incredible amount of power and we, and we can bring and make an incredible amount of uh, change. Jabari, what is something that you wish people knew about the New York Senate? Um, I wish people knew how uh, lopsided the balance of power is in New York State Legislature. Uh, we're supposed to have uh, a balance of power between the three branches of government and um, in New York, it is extremely, extremely lopsided uh, sided, uh, towards the governor's hand. And that is something we'll be working on, but um, a lot of things uh, are made or broken by his decisions uh, in ways that you know should not be. So I, I wish people knew that because then people would start to realize uh, how many things are his fault. <laughs> um, senator Harris, tell me something about being a senator in Nevada that you wish other people knew. Well, I'll... I'll get kind of technical and nerdy here. Uh, something, Please do. Yeah. Something I think people knew about legislation in general is that every new bill is not a new requirement, right? A new bill may actually be deleting something. A new bill may be amending one word from may to shall. And so the sheer number of bills that are passed really does not reflect on the the, the thickness of the, the, the state's code, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I often hear a lot of times, well, they'll just pass more bills. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, well, sometimes, yeah, but that doesn't, we might be taking stuff out, right? That's one bill. Um, so I wish people understood that a little bit more. Right, like you, you hear all the time, enforce the, the laws on the books. Well, what if a new law is about enforcing the laws on the books? Yeah, I, I hear that a lot too. Senator Floyd, I don't know much about being a senator in Oklahoma or about being a judge in Oklahoma. What's something that you wish people like me knew about the job? I think it'd be nice if more people recognize the uh, lack of diversity that we have. And it's, it's diversity in so many levels. 52% of our population are women in this state. 21% of the legislature is women. And that's up from 14% in two cycles. That's how bad, that's how disproportionate it was. Um, the lack of people of color is is embarrassing as it should be. Um, it's uh, I wish they realized the disparity between how many Democrats and Republicans there there are, especially when they're saying, well, you you people up there, you lawmakers. It's like, well, there's nine of us in the Senate, and the other thirty nine senators are Republicans. There's one hundred and one representatives, and only twenty two are Democrats on the House side. So, it's not you people, <laughs> it's, it's your people who are doing it. So I, I wish people had a better idea of how government really works in Oklahoma. We need to be teaching civics in, in elementary school, which we don't do anymore. And people just don't seem to understand how the system works. It's, uh, it's I, I think if they did, I think it would be very beneficial. They just, people just don't seem to want to engage in government. And I, and I think that's a shame. Well, I am grateful that the four of you chose to engage in government uh, despite that. And I, I want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you to everybody that's joined us today for our panel. I'm going to give each of our panelists just an opportunity to, to wrap up, say some, some uh, hopefully some words of encouragement. Um, and I'm going to start with you, Senator, uh, with Representative Park. 
All right. Well, um, you know, th the one thing that I always try and, you know, let folks know is that if I can do it, you can do it. Um, you know, I, I never grew up wanting uh, to be a politician. I never thought in my life that I would be where I am today, even a few years ago. Um, but I cared. Um, uh, you know, I, I allowed my desire to do good uh, to, to lead me, and I am where I am today um, because of it. Um, I have an opportunity uh, to not only have broken barriers and to pave the way, uh, but to influence the conversation when it comes to policy uh, that affects, uh, you know, from, from economic issues uh, to health care, uh, to, to criminal justice related matters, to, to anything and everything that, that folks could possibly care about. Um, and despite the fact that I am a member of the minority and one of 180 state legislators in Georgia, um, again, you know, from, from where I sit, um, you know, you can do an incredible amount. And so again, I, I wanna encourage folks to lean in uh, as challenging and as disheartening as the process can be. Um, if we allow cynicism to take over, then we lose. Um, so, so lean in, uh, fight hard, um, and, and bring about that change that you wanna see. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, Senator-elect Jabari Brisport, why don't you, what, what do you have as some closing words for us? Yeah, thank you. I um, I just want to say, uh, well, thanks again, Rep Sims, and thanks for the Victory Fund for making this space happen and, and inviting me because uh, I truly recognize that I, I I stand like in between, really two great historical moments. You know, I I recognize that I stand on the shoulders of incredible people who came before me, who made it possible for someone like me to run, you know, who made it possible for a queer black man to run for office and get elected, who forged the path when politics was much more hostile to people like me, when the world, like it was, it was just hostile to be a queer black man on the street, um, still is. But I'm excited that they did that. And I'm excited that I know as going in, I'm also forging a path forward for those who come after me. And in the same way that I stand on shoulders, I'm, my shoulders are getting ready for others um, to push, push the envelope even further than I do. So. I know politics can get super dark sometimes, and there are some days that are super dark, but I really feel that there are some bright days ahead, and I'm excited to be uh, just one link in this chain of something really incredible that I think is on the horizon. Well, Jabari, truly, congratulations uh, again, and, and thank you for choosing public service on, on all of our behalf. Um, Senator Floyd, the floor is yours. Thank you, Representative. I think that I am term limited. Everyone in Oklahoma is term limited to 12 years. I knew coming into this job that I would spend quite possibly, highly likely the entire, my entire political career serving and not just a minority, but a super minority. But I will tell you that uh, the minority serves such an important, such an important service. It, it, we spend a lot of time just slowing down and trying to stop really bad stuff. And even in that environment, I still love my job. So I wanna thank Victory Fund for all that they do for us, the Victory Institute for all of the support that they give us because it's some, of us, some of us in these states don't get support from very many places. So I'm very grateful for that. But I'll leave you all with this. I, I love what I do. And I was more frustrated as a voter than I have ever been as an elected official. Well, I think that's a very common sentiment, and I thank you for sharing it. Uh, Senator Harris, the, you have the last word. Well, no pressure. Um, to, to my colleagues on the panel, I just want to say, you know, keep up the good fight. We're all in this together. Um, thank you all so much for what you're doing. Um, and we're all stronger together. Um, to the people who are listening uh, to the panel, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the message I'd like to give is that the fight doesn't stop at the ballot box. You know, we're, we're used to ginning up all this excitement to, to get the people we care about elected. I'll let you know that there is so much more work to be done in order to actually get the changes that I think we all want uh, passed. Call your legislators, call into hearings. I don't think a lot of us are doing these in person uh, right now, but send emails, write letters, be there, push push and push some more. Um, 
get back up when you fall because it's going to happen. You know, the, the, the voting, that's great. Uh, but if you really want to support someone who is uh, representing you, then you got to be there year round. This is a, a, a marathon, not a sprint. Thanks so much. Thank you, Senators. Uh, thank you, Representative. Thank you, Senator-elect. And thank you to everybody who has joined us in today's breakout session. You know, there is power in state legislatures. And as we've talked about today, the growing power of LGBTQ plus people in those state legislatures means that we are accomplishing more than we've ever been able to accomplish. We are introducing more than we've ever been able to introduce. And so if you are somebody that's out there that's thinking that you want to get involved with LGBTQ politics, whether directly as a candidate, whether indirectly as a supporter of other candidates or someone who works for uh, political campaigns, for example, please reach out and explore information from the LGBTQ Victory Fund and Victory Institute. There is no organization that is working harder to find and fund and train out LGBTQ plus individuals for political engagement than the Victory Fund and the Victory Institute. With that said, we've got some closing remarks from our sponsor, George Shevlin at AIG. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, thanks for recognizing me. Um, First, I'd like to congratulate the Victory Institute for being able to pull off this event virtually. I know that that's not easy to do, uh, something like this, and to do it in the middle of a, of a global pandemic, I think is pretty commendable. Um, and uh, I spent most of my career working for the United States House of Representatives. So I understand uh, the need firsthand for our community to have a seat at the table. They say in Washington, if, uh, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So I think that the Victory Institute plays a very critical role in, in, in getting our people actually at the table and in the rooms, as, as we've heard about from our, from our representatives today. So what I didn't know about working. Oh, I think we might have lost, George, we may have lost your volume. called ERGs, employee research groups or affinity groups in a lot of companies, which I wasn't aware of when I was working for the Congress, but uh, AIG has about 46,000 employees in over 80 countries. And when I joined AIG, I was so happy to learn that we have 14 of these uh, LGBT ERGs around the world. And, and like most ERGs, we do a lot of like, you know, the socializing, networking, happy hours, things like that, mentoring, things to help uh, people with their careers and, and then also some benefits like we got a surrogacy benefit uh, at AIG and things like that. And we also do some outreach like we have an LGBT uh, travel uh, guard initiative to help our travelers uh, around the world and give them tips how to stay safe and because um, not all of the world is, is that safe for, for lesbian and gay and queer travelers. So, um, but we also have done things like uh, sign on to the uh, the amicus brief on the Title VII cases, which I think is very important to to tell the Supreme Court that the you know that the business community supports these sort of protections for for uh, LGBT employees, and you know I think we do have an impact that way. Um, and also, you know, obviously we have a big contingent in the in the in the Pride Parade around the country, New York, and and, and some of the other ones around the world. And we actually were the only ERG with our own t-shirt on the on the in the online company store so um i've been uh, me personally given my political background i've tried to get our own erg more involved in current events and uh in, in addition to the internal corporate activities that we get involved with and one of the best events i was able to organize was to have uh, mayor parker come to our houston office in february and to speak to the erg down there and um she really knocked their socks off and they were so excited to have her there that I was uh, able to get them to actually to sponsor the Victory Institute. And, and uh, that was the genesis of this. So, you know, I've been involved with the Victory uh, Fund for several decades now, and uh, I'm really glad to see what they've done. I was in the Congress when and Tammy Baldwin first came in and, and it was great to have somebody like that. And there's been so many, obviously, I, mean, I never could have imagined how many, uh, uh, elected officials we would have the, now, given where we started from. So at any rate, I really, again, like to, I want to uh, salute the Victory Institute on, uh, on their great work that you do. And, um, and just to let you know how happy I am that we were able to, to support this event. Well, thank you, George. Thank you again to AIG. Thank you to David at Union Pacific and to all the legislators that were able to join us. Um, please tune in tonight at 6.30 to um, the Leading in Color celebration. There's a lot to celebrate. 
um, you can join us at, the, of course, the, the link that led you here at the International LGBT Leaders Conference. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you.